The 1920s are a popular time period in high school history classes. Students often enjoy learning about speakeasies and flappers. Prohibition and booze runners. the Harlem Renaissance and jazz music. And The Great Gatsby fits right into that popularity as a story involving the incredibly wealthy and their subsequently interesting lives full of pomp and circumstance. The giant mansions, fancy dresses, and wild parties accompanied by full orchestras seen in The Great Gatsby helped drive the narrative that the 1920s truly were roaring. But under this gilded crust, laid an America full of turmoil and strife, an America riddled with social movements and political ideologies based on hate, an America being overrun by the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK was at its most powerful during the 1910s and 20s. The organization swelled to incredible numbers and held influence and power throughout multiple levels of government. But before we dive into the Klan of the 20s, let's take a look back at its origins. The Ku Klux Klan began shortly after the American Civil War and was founded by Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest. The KKK was originally a secretive and small organization with the sole purpose of continuing the economic, political, and social subjugation of Black Americans. The first iteration of the KKK operated as a terrorist organization, using violence and fear to create a segmented society. Between 1865 and 1900, the KKK was responsible for at least 3,500 racially motivated lynchings and had fully achieved its goals. The meager gains former slaves made following the American Civil War were completely negated by the end of the 19th century. Jim Crow laws were widespread and entrenched throughout the South, creating a two-tiered society, one for whites and one for blacks. By the turn of the century, the black vote had been so successfully suppressed that there was not a single black member of Congress for nearly the first three decades of the 1900s. And when the last of the 16 Reconstruction black representatives lost his re-election bid in 1900, there was not another black representative from a southern state until 1972. Following the end of Reconstruction, the southern states had essentially implemented all of the goals of the first iteration of the KKK. The black vote was nearly non-existent and segregation by the way of Jim Crow was the status quo across the region. Given this success, the KKK had essentially ceased to need to exist by 1900. The terrorism and violence of white Southerners led to the complete and total subjugation of black Americans up until the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century. The second iteration of the KKK had a distinctly different makeup than the secretive terrorist organization it shared the name with. The second clan was born in 1915 following the infamous epic film, The Birth of a Nation. This movie was over three hours long and told a rambling story of white heroic clansmen saving both society and pure white women from the evils of black men. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Even in the context of the 1910s, 
this silent movie was shockingly racist. One scene depicts a state house with all members being black and how uncivilized they are during the proceedings. Another scene depicts a white actor in blackface trying to convince a white woman to marry him. He then chases her through the woods. She literally jumps off a cliff and commits suicide to avoid him. Many civic organizations at the time publicly protested the film as blatant propaganda and outright lies about the history of both the Civil War and the Reconstruction period. Unfortunately, the film was granted legitimacy by one very important person, then President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. Wilson is often remembered as the author of the 14 Points, an economically progressive president, and the president whose foreign policy choices led to the U.S.'s involvement in World War I. But he should also be remembered as being a full-blown and unapologetic racist. Before his career in politics, Wilson was a college professor and historian who was a major contributor to the genre that came to be known as New South Revisionism. New Southern Revisionism was an attempt by white, Southern historians to retell the story of the American Civil War and Reconstruction in a new way. You've likely heard some of these New South Revisionism attempts 
as they're still somewhat popular among certain people to this day. Referring to the Civil War as the War of Northern Aggression, bringing up the terrible deeds of carpetbaggers, and erecting the statues of Confederate generals to, quote, learn history, are just a few examples of this form of revisionist history. President Wilson held the first ever movie viewing in the White House for Birth of a Nation. The high praise for the film offered by the president granted the film the legitimacy it needed for many Americans to feel it was okay to begin openly talking about their prejudices. Following the unprecedented commercial success of Birth of a Nation, the Klan came roaring back to life, but in a completely new way. The Klan was no longer a secret. It was no longer for elites only. It was no longer a movement only in the South. In fact, the Second Klan found its most success in middle-of-the-country states like Ohio, Indiana, and Colorado. At one point, Approximately 30% of all white men in Indiana were official members of the KKK. The Klan moving north was mostly caused by two significant factors. First, throughout the beginning of the 20th century, a phenomenon known as the Great Migration was taking place. Millions of black Americans were moving from the rural south to northern urban centers. In the 1910 census, 90% of all African Americans lived in the south. By 1970, over half of all African Americans were now living in northern and western cities. Second, huge numbers of immigrants from Europe were coming into the country through Ellis Island and settling in those same northern urban centers. Because so few people of color were living in the north and midwest prior to the Great Migration, and because nearly all of the white people in these areas followed the same few Protestant branches of Christianity, most people in those parts of the country were fairly unconcerned with race or religious issues. Their societies were almost entirely homogeneous. They didn't need Jim Crow laws or to suppress the black vote or to define what it meant to be American because there weren't any blacks or Jews or Catholics or un-American people in those communities. Throughout the beginning of the 20th century, however, that began to change. This combination of an influx of outsiders, an unrepentant racist in the White House, and the popularity of Birth of a Nation led to an explosion of interest in an organization that claimed to, quote, protect white citizens. While it is impossible to know the accuracy of such a claim, in the early 1920s, the KKK boasted a membership of over 6 million people. The birth of a nation sparked a revival of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. The Klan's ideology of white supremacy and what they called 100% Americanism resonated across the country. The Klan of the 1920s was not a rural Klan, which the Klan uh, of Reconstruction had primarily been. The Klan of the 1920s was very big in surprising places, places like Denver, like Portland, Detroit, which had huge waves of immigration, both of Catholics from Europe and of African Americans coming from the South. In 1925, 50,000 Klan's men and women gathered in Washington in a vivid display of their numbers. Four million Americans claimed Klan membership. That particular Klan also became very, very powerful politically. They elected at least 10 governors. And there were all sorts of public officials who were elected by power of the Klan. Another reason the KKK expanded was because it expanded its list of un-American people. The organization designed to suppress black Americans broadened their message of exclusion to now include Jews, Catholics, immigrants, and essentially anyone 
who wasn't fully descended from Northern European and Protestant ancestors. Furthermore, the clan's position against these new groups went hand in hand with their position on prohibition. The clan built their narrative on stereotypes of Irish and Central and Eastern European immigrants as being drunks who were beholden to the Pope and who would eventually ruin American society. Prohibition became a central component to clan power, both in their recruitment of new members and in how they influenced the actual function of local government. Much like the enforcement of the prohibition of marijuana today, racial minorities and the economically disadvantaged were at a much higher risk of arrest for possession of alcohol during the 1920s. The Klan expertly used these stereotypes to argue for law and order politics and to sell itself as the only way to protect American communities. Prohibition has often been thought of as a joke. It wasn't enforced. Well, it was enforced against particular selected communities. If you were a working class American and you drank during prohibition, it was a very high risk activity, especially if you were a person of color. African Americans in the South, Latinos in the West, were heavily targeted by law enforcement for even possessing small amounts of alcohol. Under the Jones Law, signed two days into Hoover's new administration, Sentences for first-time offenders increased tenfold. Even a witness to someone having a drink could face three years behind bars. Wealthy Americans, for the most part, choose to ignore the new law. But for working-class Americans, the consequences of these new harsh laws are devastating. Seeing father of three sentenced to 15 years for having a pint of alcohol, Headlines like that did not do any favor for the prohibitionists. Prohibition violators, by 1930, were the largest class of long-term violators in federal prisons. But prison isn't the worst fate. Minority Americans are stalked by vigilante organizations operating under the guise of prohibition enforcement the most infamous and brutal is the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan had actually kind of died out in the 1890s, but in the late 19-teens and 1920s, the Klan is reorganized. Prohibition provided a new mantle for the Klan's mission, a kind of a legitimacy, because it sold itself as a law and order organization and it recruits at the local level, arguing that it is going to clean up communities. It's gonna get rid of bootleggers. It's gonna get rid of liquor law violators. And it was really a way of instrumentally utilizing the law for its wider mission, for its anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, and white supremacist mission. This iteration of the Klan, however, burned out quickly. Its power grew for about a decade, but quickly collapsed due to a multitude of factors, including corruption and exposés about several terrible acts of violence done in the name of the Klan. The Klan has a great rise in terms of membership through the first half of the 1920s, and it has an equally spectacular fall. There were a number of exposés of what the Klan was doing in terms of its violent underside. When you throw scandals in that really embarrass the leaders, that kind of publicity really eroded its credibility. The final death knell for the second iteration of the Klan, however, was the onset of the Great Depression and the repeal of Prohibition. In un as unemployment skyrocketed and overall attitudes about alcohol consumption changed, the Klan lost nearly all of the massive membership it held just a few years earlier. People no longer had the means to belong to fraternal organizations that required membership fees. It was cheaper to just hold those same prejudices without actually going to clan meetings. It's important for us to understand, to study the second clan, because it shows how quickly political attitudes can change in America. It shows us the power of a good narrative to convince literally millions of American citizens 
that joining a terrorist organization was a good idea. It shows us what happens when we choose to align our political beliefs with messages of exclusion and hatred. It reminds us that the experience for some Americans is not the same experience for all Americans, and that wrapping up our understanding of the past into oversimplifications like the Roaring Twenties can greatly skew our perceptions of what life was actually like for the majority of the American people.